My videos tend to cover the tortured denizens of Gotham City as they appeared in the seminal Batman the Animated Series, although in recent months I've expanded to look at the wounded and broken characters of Batman Beyond and Superman the Animated Series. The subject of today's video, Lobo, is a Superman villain in the DC Animated Universe, but in reality he's the opposite of the kind of villain I usually cover. He is a joyous celebration of hooliganism, lewd, crude, with heaps of attitude. If any character epitomises the counterculture spirit of the 1990s, in my eyes it's Lobo. Before looking at how such an inappropriate character managed to make his way to the DC Animated Universe, let's start by looking at Lobo's comic book origins. The first thing I want to make clear is that the comic book Lobo is not a Superman villain. It would take more than five years for Lobo to come into contact with Superman. Lobo first appeared in 1983's Omega Men number 3, but he looked a little different to the character we know now. He was more like a glam rocker wearing an orange and purple leotard, looking more like David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust than, say, Motorhead's Lemmy Kilmister. That wasn't the only thing about the original Lobo that differs from what we know the character to be now. Originally, Lobo was the last Velorpian, a race of aliens that were able to replicate themselves from a single drop of their own blood. This made them pretty powerful beings, and also put a big target on their backs. The entire species was killed off by the Scions, a highly intelligent reptilian species that... Ugh you know what, none of that really matters. All you need to know is that Lobo was the last of his kind and he was a skilled bounty hunter that was hired to bring in the Omega Men. Now, the Omega Men are, in my eyes, a pretty forgettable group of space adventurers and ultimately they're not that significant in the grand scheme of things because, following Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1985, Lobo's appearance changed, switching to jeans and a leather jacket. His species was also changed, he was now the last Zarnian. Rather than being the victims of another vile species, the Zarnians were killed off by Lobo, who simply wanted to be a completely unique being. As a teenager, Lobo created a plague that killed off his entire species, and then set out to define himself once everyone was dead. He tried out for a number of roles, a plumber, a used car salesman, a shoe salesman, ouch, but none of them took. It wasn't until fate intervened that Lobo happened upon his true calling, being a bounty hunter. He would use his abilities to become one of the best hunters in the entire universe, but it's worth noting that as vile as Lobo was, he had a soft side too. Lobo's one true love, the thing he valued above all others. Space Dolphins Lobo would go above and beyond to protect these majestic creatures, and when one of them was killed in a space hit and run incident, it brought Lobo to the attention of one Vril Dox. Vril Dox, who is sort of kind of the son of Superman villain Brainiac, but that's a topic for another time, recruited Lobo to his licensed extra governmental interstellar operatives network, or Legion for short. Dox hired Lobo and used his ability to regrow copies of himself to create an army of Lobos to bring order to a chaotic drug baron planet. But the devious Dox betrayed Lobo shortly after and removed his ability to grow new clones, and beat him in a one-on-one -on -one battle to command his loyalty. Shortly after this, Lobo was given his own miniseries that would do more to define the character than any of his earlier stories. The comic was written by Lobo co-creator Keith Giffen and Alan Grant, a Scottish writer that cut his teeth in the American comics market writing Batman, and was illustrated by 2000 AD artist Simon Bisley, also from Scotland. Giffen had always said that he intended Lobo to be a commentary on the gritty anti-heroes that became popular during the 80s and 90s, characters like the Punisher and Wolverine for instance. Giffen, Grant and Bisley took that basic concept and cranked it up to 11. Lobo was now a grotesque, over-the-top, satirical, hulking mass of muscle that lived a life of excess. He smoked, he drank, he fornicated, he maimed, murdered and masticated his way through the universe. He was the living embodiment of the id, doing whatever he pleased in over-the-top, often obscene adventures. So powerful was Lobo's will he was able to do things that were physically impossible, like talking in the vacuum of space. Some highlights from Lobo's career include accepting a contract from the Easter Bunny to kill Santa, being reincarnated twice, once as a woman and once as a squirrel, before being returned to his original body and banned from returning to heaven or hell because he caused too much of a ruckus in the afterlife, temporarily becoming a parody of Robocop by having his brain transferred to a gigantic mechanical killing machine whose only goal was to destroy all crime and make way for a massive parking lot. Did I forget to mention that he had a radio implanted in his mind so that he could listen to his favourite song 24-7? Yeah, that happened too. I don't use the adjective awesome very often, I personally think it's massively overused and has lost almost all of its meaning, but I think it fits Lobo pretty well. You could say radical, tubular? No, no, let's not say that one. I would describe his comics as a guilty pleasure if I felt even the slightest bit guilty about reading them, but I don't because these are excellent pieces of satire and I love the over-the-top artwork. They're not likely to change the world, but they are fun. 
and that brings us to the DCAU version of Lobo. So you might find yourself wondering how a vulgar character could make his way to a cartoon intended for children. Well, surprisingly, he made the transition fairly intact. We're introduced to Lobo in the two-parter The Main Man. There's a very neat yet subtle callback to Superman and Lobo's first comic book encounter. When the comic book Lobo first sought out Superman, he came across Superman's biggest fan, Bibbo Babowski. The two would come into conflict over their opinions on Superman and would wind up getting drunk together and getting up to shenanigans. The DCAU Lobo references this by having the voice actor Brad Garrett play both Bibbo and Lobo. And I really appreciate that deep cut reference, so well done whoever made that call. The story opens with Superman sharing his Kryptonian tech with Professor Hamilton at Star Labs, testing the capabilities of his spacecraft. As he looks on in wonder, Hamilton ponders all of the other wonderful species that may be out there in the universe, just waiting to be discovered. And then we cut to Lobo. Their Lobo is a gluttonous space biker and bounty hunter. He's not a member of Legion, his space dolphins aren't anywhere to be seen, he can't grow clones of himself from his blood. No, instead, when we first meet him, he's in the middle of a bar fight while trying to capture a target. He succeeds by using bystanders as shields before tossing them aside and shooting his way out of the bar, before blowing the whole thing up. Immediately, this establishes that Lobo is quite unlike anyone we've seen so far. Eventually, Lobo is hired to retrieve Superman so that he could be added to a space zoo for endangered species. He is, after all, the last Kryptonian. Lobo has no qualms about capturing sentient beings and locking them in cages. All he cares about is the pile of loot he's going to be given for his trouble. I may be saying something a little controversial here, but I think that the biggest strength of the animated Lobo is the fact that he is something of a mirror image of Superman. Perhaps a dark reflection, if that's not too pretentious to say. They're both the last survivors of their respective species. While Superman was saved by his loving parents and sent to Earth as a child, Lobo murdered 5 billion people on his home planet as part of a school science project and set off to explore the universe on his own. They both track down evildoers and bring them to justice. Superman does this through mostly peaceful means while Lobo resorts to fighting and shooting at the first hurdle. Superman does this because he believes it's the right thing to do. Lobo does it for financial reward. Where Lobo flies through space on a loud, aggressive motorbike, Superman uses a sleek spaceship. Then we have the way they treat women. Now obviously, Lois Lane is the object of Superman's affections in most of this series, and Superman treats her respectfully. Although that part where he, as Clark Kent, tells her that he's really Superman and uses his powers to steal her byline, which she takes as a joke, is genuinely hilarious. Lobo, meanwhile, treats Lois as an object. When he realises that Lois knows Superman and that Superman cares about her, he turns his attentions to her. Lobo propositions Lois, and when she rejects him with a slap, he delights in that act of aggression. Now, I don't think that Lobo necessarily desired Lois, certainly not any more so than any other woman he's come across, but the fact that Superman clearly cared about her made the prospect of bedding her far too much for him to resist. The parallels with Superman continue in the later episode Warrior Queen, where Superman rejects the marriage proposal of an alien warrior queen, Maxima. Maxima bemoans the lack of suitable suitors in her throne room, and then, of all people, Lobo bursts through the ceiling looking to collect a bounty on one of her fellows. The look of delight on Maxima's face is quite revealing. It's a shame we never saw how that relationship turned out. I suspect that Lobo was not looking to settle down and probably would tire of a mate that was a physical match for him, with a similar lust for combat. The comparisons with Superman don't end there. In the Justice League two-parter hereafter, when Superman is believed to be dead, who should turn up to fill his shoes? Lobo. And the truly funny thing is that Lobo acts as a decent substitute for Superman. Sure, he can't fly or shoot heat beams from his eyes, but he's more than capable of taking on the criminals that are rampaging through the city after Superman's funeral. And the collective despair on the Justice League's face as they realise that they really do need Lobo is quite a sight to see. One of the more subtle details that I really like is how Lobo wears a black armband, intended as a sign of respect for the fallen Man of Steel, around his head. It's the perfect representation of how Lobo subverts expectations. The fact that he wears the headband and turns up to lead the Justice League of his own volition indicates that he actually has deep respect for Superman, believing him to be his equal, and has been keeping track on what was going on with him. When Superman inevitably returns, Lobo quickly removes the headband off camera, presumably so Superman doesn't see his little tribute, and tries to make nice. Superman of course rejects Lobo, and he doesn't put up a fight. He hops on his bike and leaves, grumbling about how ungrateful Superman and the Justice League are. While he seems a little angry, personally I think part of him is glad that Superman isn't really dead. But getting back to the main man, I'd say that part two is probably the weaker of the two parts. Lobo wound up being betrayed and was also put in an exhibit in the zoo and would team up with Superman to escape. It's mostly an action-filled story as Superman attempts to evade capture without his full powers, while juggling his new partnership with Lobo. 
While there isn't much to talk about in terms of character development, there's plenty of great scenes. For instance, Superman's scheme to get his powers back involving a dodo was pretty clever, and the battle with the Collector in his true form was quite shocking. Having said that, the scene where Superman and Lobo fight off a giant space snake and Lobo skins it makes me wince every time I see it. Just imagine the grains of sand scraping against that tender, exposed, translucent flesh. Hey! There may not be an awful lot to say about it, but it's still a very good episode. And that's it for Lobo's appearances in the DCAU cartoons. There were plans for a Lobo spin-off cartoon in 1998, headed by Batman the Animated Series director Boyd Kirkland. But Warner Brothers executives lost faith in the project shortly before production began, and it was cancelled. In the year 2000, Warner Brothers took some of the concepts for the show and reworked them into a web cartoon. The animation was pretty crude and low budget, as early 2000s web cartoons tended to be, but it was quite faithful to the comic books. It cannot be classed as a DCAU show because none of the creative team involved in it worked on any of the other DCAU shows. Their Lobo had a more comic book accurate design rather than the rectangular, blocky DCAU design, and none of the DCAU voice talent returned to work on the show. If you're a fan of the character and haven't seen it, give it a watch sometime. I'll link to the full show in the info box above. I'm of two minds about Lobo. Yes, he does bad things. He's quite happy hurting people. He has no regard for the lives of others. He is motivated by his base desires and greed. All of these things contribute to him being classified as a villain. And yet, while many of Superman's other foes are petty, driven by a desire for power, for revenge, or out of anger, at the end of the day, Lobo just wants to make a ton of money and have a good time. He could quite easily steal, but instead turns his attention to collecting bounties on bad people that are wanted by the authorities. Essentially, he's killing two birds with one stone. He's earning lots of money and taking part in his favourite pastime, getting into fights. And he is a man of his word. While he does share similarities with Superman, their differences are stark. Where Superman is a symbol of truth, justice and a better tomorrow, Lobo stands for drinking, fighting and fornicating. At the end of the day, he is a villain. A lovable villain, but a villain nonetheless. Okay, that's it for this week's essay. If you like the video, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, tell all your friends about me. You know how YouTube works. If you really enjoyed the video and have the means, please consider making use of the thanks button to send a buck or two my way because every little helps. I offer channel memberships for $1.99 a month. This will get you early access to my weekly video essay, priority responses to your comments, members only videos, custom emojis, and an icon on your profile indicating that you're one of my people. And special thanks to my current channel members who are all listed on the screen right now. Next time I'm going to continue to work my way through the villains of Batman Beyond by shining a spotlight on the nefarious Shriek and talk about how he had a legitimate gripe with the Batman of tomorrow, Terry McGuinness. Hope to see you then.